I want to start off asking you a question, and then I'm going to pass it on, and others will ask you questions. So my experience is that each week, I feel really excited and interested as we focus on one aspect of the sutta, hindrances, mental factors, whatever it is. And then we move on, and I feel like, oh, I forgot what last week or three weeks or 10 weeks ago was, and I'm focused on the current material, but I, I have this sense of kind of anxiety about what I've forgotten. And so my question to you is, <laughs> is that inevitable? And do you have any suggestions? Uh, in some way, I think it is inevitable because uh, there's so much material. So much. You know, and in the sutta itself, the Buddha laid out uh, so many different ways of practicing. Uh -huh. uh, and I, I don't think the idea is to necessarily keep them all in mind all the time and intentionally uh, trying to have them present. Uh -huh. you know, that would be impossible. Uh, okay. What I think might be helpful, and of course this is the Vipassana practice, um, mm -hmm. Is to really pay attention in in any sitting, even at, let's say after you've uh, devoted yourself to exploring a particular instruction, uh -huh. then to sit in a more open awareness. Not necessarily to do that for the whole sitting or every sitting during the week, mm -hmm. but to give some time to it. Then to sit in an open awareness and really become mindful of whatever is predominant and what's arising predominantly will be in one of the four satipatthanas. Okay. So it's a chance to integrate as much as you remember anyway, uh -huh. Uh -huh. you know, through, throughout, the, throughout the week. Okay. Um, That's helpful. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, I, yeah, I, w I, wouldn't, I wouldn't stay exclusively mm -hmm. with just one instruction. Right. Even though you give emphasis to it for some time mm -hmm. in the week. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to uh, pass you on to the next person. <clears throat> Hello, Joseph. I'm Hal. Hi. Uh, um, Thank you so much for doing this. That's much appreciated. Uh, and in recent weeks, we were talking about mental factors. And I was really kind of struck by uh, one of the phrases that she used in, in the book. And I'm hoping you can elaborate on the concept that the someone behind experience does not exist. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> I, th I think there's a problem even in the way the question was formulated because in the formulation of the question, you're already positing a someone who doesn't exist. Yes. Uh, so that someone is not there in the first place. <laughs> and I think that's part of and what... So, so um, there are different, you know, the, the understanding of selflessness, of course, uh, takes a long time. It's so counterintuitive you know, that it really takes a long time of just sitting with the idea, both on a conceptual level, just trying to understand it intellectually, conceptually, and then applying it in the practice. Uh, just a couple of the ways of specific practices that I found helpful in that. Uh, and I don't know whether you've come to this part of the book or not. It's, when I talked about reframing the way we're languaging the experience to ourselves in the passive voice, did, yes. did you read that yet or not? Yes, yes. yes. I, I found that sort of a very um, direct, immediate way into sort of an immediate connection with the experience of selflessness of just a sound being known or a sensation being known. 
because the language itself, uh, the I, the self, is not in the in the construct, you know. And to see how spontaneously the being known happens, no one is there doing anything. It, it, it happens completely by itself. You know, when when you hear a sound, or even I don't know, it may be a little difficult. Uh, doing it with the sound of my voice because because you're connecting with the conceptual level, but in just hearing sound, in the sound of the bell or the background sounds, how they appear and are known, no one is there. It's just the sound is being known. Uh, I was working with somebody um, was fairly new to practice, just has been practicing a couple of years, you know, was really trying to kind of get a handle on this whole experience of selflessness. And I had mentioned this particular technique to him, and it took him a while. I mean, the first, the first few times we talked about it and he tried, it didn't really connect. But he kept at it, and at a certain point, it's like he understood what that was about. And all of a sudden, and the way he expressed it to me, he said he felt like it was it was a very uh, immediate entree to that experience of selflessness. So I don't know the degree to which you've actually, you know, used that as a tool, uh, but it might be worth persevering with it. Okay. Um, okay. And again, it's not. I found it particularly helpful in the walking practice because in the walking meditation, there's really no struggle to find the object. You know, it's a, the, the, move, the sensations of the movement are so apparent. And so it's easy to relax into the body. It's almost like you're doing Tai Chi or, you know, a slow bend. You're just, it's just the movement. And in the movement, the sensations of the movement are being known. Okay. Yeah, and they're being known absolutely simultaneous with their arising. It's not that there's anyone waiting to know. Right? The knowing is just happening exactly in the moment. So the sensations are being known. And you could repeat that occasionally. It's not like that becomes a mantra, but just as a way of settling into that frame of reference. Right. You know, okay, so the sensations are just being known and then you're in that experience of them being known. And I think at a certain point you'll see that is completely effortless. Hmm. You know, there's no, there's, no, um, yeah, there's no struggle in that experience. And it may give you a very clear sense of this whole notion that there's no one there behind the process. Um, so it's worth, I think it's worth persevering a bit with it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, That's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, next. Mm -hmm. oh. Just let me say that in response to any of your questions, you know, if you if you want to just, if something's not clear or you need a follow-up, it's fine. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, Joseph. I'm Jackie. Hi, Jackie. Thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is concerning how to discern between wholesome and unwholesome. Mm -hmm. I've been thinking a lot about that. and. I have some ideas about how I experience that discernment in that perhaps when something is unskillful or unwholesome, I have a certain sensation in my body, a mm -hmm. sensation that I, that there's maybe some resistance or, or something there, agitation or, or something. But I, I wanted to know what your thinking was about discerning between wholesome and unwholesome. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, it's a great question because it's just, it's so key to the whole unfolding path. Um, I think your, your way of doing it 
is really a good one. You know, paying attention to the body because in the unwholesome mind states, there's always some kind of unease. E even with the pleasant ones, you know, even w when there's desire or some, some manifestation of greed, there's, there's some kind of tightening. Did, did you get to the uh, place in the talks of the book when I, was, when I was talking about, you know, walking down Fifth Avenue in New York and looking? Yes. yes. I think it was, yeah, it was on the, the hindrance of desire. Mm -hmm. And just the difference between wanting and not wanting, you know, and the, the going from some kind of contraction, even in what seems pleasurable, mm -hmm. and then feeling the ease of not wanting. It's, it's like, feels like we're let out of the grip of something. Mm -hmm. So paying attention to the body in that way, I yeah. think is really helpful. Uh, also, if you hold that question, you know, as, as you're engaged either in various activities or just watching your mind, you know, through the day, and you hold that question, you know, is this wholesome or unwholesome? It would be interesting just for you to uh, connect with your intuition about it. Because I think we actually already know. You know sometimes we override the knowing. We, we don't want to know you know, sometimes when it's unwholesome because for whatever reason we're conditioned or habituated wanting to continue with it. But I think there's some place in us that know, oh yeah, this, if, if we take the moment to stop and check in, which often we don't do, mm -hmm. you know, but if we do, then, yeah, I, I, I would see if you uh, learn anything from connecting with your intuition mm -hmm. and about it. Mm -hmm. you know, is this wholesome? Is this unwholesome? And then check to see whether it's accurate or not. Mm -hmm. Even the, noting, um, noting the rationalization that yeah, exactly. <laughs> for doing something that I know is unwholesome. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, would, I, I mean, we all do it. <laughs> uh, if, if, if we didn't have that pattern, we'd be saints. <laughs> you know, so we, we all have that, and so it's a good, it's a good field of observation. To, the key, of course, and I, I have a sense you're already doing this, is to be able to investigate this without self-judgment. You know, and so when we see the unwholesome aspects in the mind, uh, you know, at, at a certain point, and this was in a way a turning point for me in my practice, uh, when I became happy to see the defilements, because I would rather see them than not see them. Mm -hmm. you know, so, so instead of kind of the initial response of just judging myself for, oh, there I go again. Oh yeah, uh, Mara, I see you. Uh, and there's a kind of joy in that, there's a kind of delight in the seeing. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think this, this investigation is, is really good. As I said, checking in with the body and then also uh, trusting your intuition. Uh, yeah. Thank you. There's also, I, I don't know if you remember it, um, there were four unwholesome mental factors which are present in every unwholesome mind state. And I'm not sure I remember all the four of it, but one was restlessness in the mind. Mm -hmm. One was, uh, you know, the hiri otapa. The, the, uh, it's often translated as moral shame and moral dread, which is not really very good translations. But it's it's the lack of that. It's the lack of considering oh, this is not a good thing to be doing. You know, when, when we don't bring that, and delusion, that was, that was the mm -hmm. fourth one. But the one that, that struck me particularly was 
to really look for the quality of restlessness. You know, that, I found that pretty interesting, that in every unwholesome mind state, that's there. Mm. You know, so that can be really subtle, but, but an interesting, I think really interesting to see, oh yeah, it's when the mind is restless that it goes for the unwholesome. Mm. It's sort yeah. of an intention so, or a leaning toward something. Yeah, yeah, or, or just we're restless. <clears throat> And in some way, we think that whatever the unwholesome act may be is going to make us feel better. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that makes sense. So, yeah, it's, I think it's a really important investigation. And, uh, I'll be working on that. <laughs> yeah. It's, you know, I, one of the phrases that uh, you find in the text, which can be a useful just tool. I call it wagging the finger at Mara. You know, so often in the text, the Buddha will say, Mara, I see you. Mm -hmm. You know, so when we see him, when we see an unwholesome state of, oh, Mara, I see you. Mm -hmm. You know, it helps to disengage. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. makes sense. Thank you. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Joseph. I'm Jeff. Hi. Um, so after immersing yourself in the Satipatthana Sutta, which, by the way, I'm enjoying going into detail each week, the detail that you go into. But after you yourself have immersed yourself in it for a few years and now taught it, are there one or two essentials that stand out for you? Hmm. Well, not so much in terms of particular objects to note. Um, two things come to mind. I haven't, I haven't really thought of it in that way, so your question is, uh, I'm responding off the top of my head at the moment. Um, two things are coming to mind. One is uh, the re understanding that one of the meanings of sati, of mindfulness, and kind of the root meaning of it, is to remember. Right? And so, kind of highlighting that in the practice, it's not difficult to be mindful. It's difficult to remember to be mindful. And remembering that. Right. You know, because we can, we can get so caught up in wanting to be mindful, you know, and efforting. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually something, something recently, just in a recent sitting, you know, came, came to mind, which was a very good reminder to me of just this. You know how often we're sitting and uh, how to say, we're either wanting or waiting for some better state to arise. More concentrated or whatever it is. But then remembering that all conditioned phenomena are impermanent and unsatisfying. <clears throat> so everything we're wanting to happen falls into that category also. And the Buddha's instruction is, you know, abandon that which doesn't belong to you. You know, if you abandon that which doesn't belong to you, it'll be for your happiness and well-being. Well, what doesn't belong to us? Everything. <laughs> and so I saw myself kind of, okay, practicing, you know, 
wanting to get some better state, which still has to be abandoned as being so. Abandoned here means let go of. Right? So why not let go of whatever's arising now? Why wait for some better state to let go of? <laughs> So it, 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 it just brings home, it brings home that aspect of the freedom, even on a momentary level, is always available. It's not dependent on a certain state being present, because everything that's arising is going to pass away, right? And so if, if we just, re that's why the, the Remembering that sati means remembering. <laughs> you know, so, so it's all about remembering this. Right? And so then in our practice, with whatever the object is, you know, in any of the four foundations, the practice remains the same, you know, in some fundamental way. It's being aware of it without holding, without grasping. And so it, it just makes the freedom aspect of the practice more immediate. It's not some distant, far-off goal. Um, so that's what comes to mind right now. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Joseph. I'm Mark. Hi, Mark. Um, so I've heard you talk many times in great depth about uh, mindfulness of body um, in great detail. And I find that I struggle with getting beyond some kind of basic sensations of pressure, heat, tingling, uh, uh, that sort of thing. It's almost like my mind just doesn't go, doesn't go there, doesn't go any further. And so I'm my question for you is, how do you recommend pursuing this? I'm not sure what further place you want to get to. <laughs> well, it's sort of, it's like, well, this seems really important to get to more detail, more fine-tuning my um, awareness of sensation. Um, but I feel like I, I get to a point, and it kind of stays there, and I just with it um, but I sort of there's a sense that okay. uh, my practice might be better if I was you know drilling down deeper or experiencing something else uh -huh. okay so so a couple of things one is I mean those sensations that you described are those are the elements mm -hmm. of the body so it's not that uh, you know, there's going to be some other huge field of experience. That is the field. Um, in terms of refining, you know, your experience of those very sensations, mm -hmm. um, there are two things that, that uh, are coming to mind right now. One is, you know, when you listen to kind of the sound of a bell. You, you can fret, oh, I'm hearing the bell. Or if you kind of just get quiet and receptive, you can hear the many kind of vibratory quality of it. But even, even within a very short time, there are many arisings and passings within what we're calling the sound of the bell. So, um, the, the, first, the first important level shift in terms of mindfulness of the body is going from the concept level to the level of direct experience. And so you may be feeling something and just pay attention to whether there's an overlay, a conceptual overlay like, oh, my shoulder or my back. Mm -hmm. because, because the concept, to the degree that we're on the conceptual level, or even if there's just a, an overlay of that, the concept doesn't change. You know, back, 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 mm -hmm. back today, back tomorrow, back yesterday. And so we need to drop into the actual felt sensation of what we're calling 
back or knee. And so that's the pressure or the tingling or the tightness. So first make sure that you've dropped mm -hmm. into that level. Mm -hmm. Then, rather than the sense of boring deep, why don't you try kind of the other approach of uh, kind of getting very receptive as, as if you're listening to it rather than Yeah, rather than, be interesting, rather than observing it, which is of course that so much of the, so much of the language of the practice is about observation, mm -hmm. you know, observe, note, notice, but that can actually be, a, that language can be a hindrance. And I found that it's much more helpful to use more receptive language, for example, feeling it rather than observing it. Right? And just, okay. just that shift of perspective, you know, allows the mind to soften and relax and just to receive, to receive the flow of sensations that are happening. Right? Sometimes, sometimes the effort of observing actually obscures the, the mm -hmm. refinement, mm -hmm. you know, because, because we're trying too hard. Yeah. Is, is this, yeah, is this, this, it's resonating, crazy? yeah. Yeah, and, and so you might think of what it's like to listen to music, to listen to the sound of a bell, and bring that perspective, okay, can I just listen to the pressure or the burning? And in that, in that non-doing, that receptive mode, I think you'll become aware of the many nuances of it, mm. you know, the subtle vibrations of it. So that's one, yeah. one pr practice. There's another, uh, there's another way of being with the body that I've found very helpful. Uh, it's, I don't think it's actually in the book or in the talks. Um, have you heard any of the the times that I've taught uh, using a phrase from the Satipatthana Sutta, where he's, in the refrain where it says, uh, be mindful, and then it quotes, there is a body, to the extent necessary for clear knowing and continuous mindfulness. And so I've been, both in myself and in teaching, Using that phrase, there is a body, really almost as a mental note. So I just want a little sidebar here. Uh, you know, a few years ago we were having a big construction pro uh, project at IMS, building a new dorm. And so it was, it was kind of fun just watching it go up. And as you know, in the building of you know, a house or a structure, first it's framed. So for quite a while, the frame was there, but before it was enclosed. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in that state, you could look through it right, and see everything that was going on inside. So the phrase, there is a body, you know, in sitting and also in walking, very interesting. We just use that, it's like the frame of the building. You know, it's a very gentle, oh, there's a body settling into that frame and then staying open to whatever arises within the frame. So in this case, the mind is not narrowing in on the sensation. Rather, it's holding the larger context of the frame and simply being aware of whatever's arising within it. Is that is clear so far? Yeah, yeah. I can try that. So in doing that, it's pretty interesting because first it's very relaxed, it's, it's more open, it's not the kind of narrowing of the atten mm -hmm. attention. Oh, there is a body. And I think you'll get a better sense or an easier sense of just different sensations appearing and changing and moving within the frame. But you're not, you're not zeroing in on them. Mm -hmm. 
and you may have a clearer sense of the changing, flowing nature. So, it's, so in both ways, in one it is, you know, feeling in a, in a more focused but receptive way, as if you're listening, and the other is giving a wider frame to it. Yeah. So I, both in the sitting and in the walking, I've, I've done this a lot in walking meditation, just oh, there's a body, you know, that's, and really what the, the experience becomes, it's just feeling sensations in space. That, that's the actual felt experience. And it's kind of ironic because in using that there is a body, we begin to feel that actually there isn't a body, uh -huh. and the body is a concept. Yeah. So anyway, these are the two approaches that you might try. Great, thank you. Yeah. Hello, Joseph. I'm Irene. And uh, thank you for coming. This is a great honor and a little daunting. Um, so my question is about mental noting. And uh, I've kind of come to terms with the fact that it doesn't work for me very well um, a long time ago. Um, but there's things about it that really appeal to me. You know, the fact that it kind of puts a framework around your experience and keeps you on track. And uh, so I've, you know, numerous attempts at mental noting, and I know that you talk about it and other very well-respected teachers talk about it, and I just can't, you know, it's kind of along the, the lines of the question that you just answered. It seems like it's better for me to have a somatic experience of whatever the experience is as opposed to, you know, having to take the, I mean, you know, you're talking milliseconds maybe, but to take the time to you know, put it into a word and then to actually say the word so you're not actually having the experience mm -hmm. of whatever it is you're experiencing. You're, you know, it's... Yeah. So, I, I guess I just am looking for an explanation of how it can work for anybody. <laughs> uh, well, it just, the their minds must work very different than mine or something, yeah. I don't know. Oh, sure. First, it's to understand that the mental learning is just a tool. It's not the essence of the practice. So the essence of the practice is the awareness and being mindful. And as you probably know, there are lots, there are lots of uh, methods that don't use mental learning at all. So it's not, it's not a problem. It's not, it's, it's not like you need to feel, oh, I need to do this. But in your question, you indicated that, you know, you could see some value in it. You know, if it could work. So what, what I would do is not undertake it. Well, I'm going to back up a minute. If you want to experiment with it, I would do it in two different ways. And they're, in a way, they're a little opposite. You might take short periods, maybe even five minutes, you know, at a time in a sitting uh, where, you, where you try to note whatever's arising just for that five minutes and then let it go. You know, and then maybe half an hour later, do another five minutes. And just see what the effect is, see whether it actually helps you be more mindful, you know, or more exact or more precise or not. You know, does the mind stay as concentrated and connected without it as with it? So it's just a kind of testing for yourself to see is this helpful without, without burdening yourself with the idea, oh my God, I need to be doing this for the hour. And, I, and I've uh, done that. I've tried that numerous times and I always uh -huh. feel like I'm at a lag with experience, you know, with, with whatever, the ex whatever it is that I'm being mindful of. It's, it's happening a fraction of a second after the experience of sort of taking in whatever that thing is. Right. Well, a couple of things here. One is, um, uh, it, especially if uh, things are moving quickly, you know, and there are just many things happening. I wouldn't try to note everything. You, you might note you might note every tenth object, or, mm -hmm. 
you know, because uh, when we're aware, when we're aware of a rapid flow of phenomena, the noting is too slow. Right. You know, the, that process is too slow for what's happening. And so, if you're trying to note everything, you can always feel that lag. Whereas, if you're in the flow, and then you know, every, every tenth or whatever it is, you just drop you drop a note in acknowledging what's happening. So that might make it more useful instead of always feeling like you're a second behind. Right? So another way of doing it is not not to try to note in this way but to reserve this particular tool for um, when you feel particularly caught or lost. Right. You know, when, when there's a hindrance. Uh, uh, so then it can be really helpful as a way of framing it so that you're not so lost in it, so that you're not so identified with it. You know, if there's some strong emotion that's arising, oh, anger. You know, or sadness or whatever. Uh, so, so then you're using them in just a very, um, what's the word? At very specific times, not trying to do it as a regular tool of right. practice, but as something in your toolbox. So I, I deal with chronic pain, so that would probably actually be a really good time to use it is when I'm getting really caught in the aversion and the, yeah. you know, the yeah. kind of locked in. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so in speaking of the pain, so this this is a good example of uh, an experience I had, which I think is I used in the book as well. Uh, I was doing it on the other side of getting caught in particular fantasies again and again, and so I started noting pleasant, pleasant, but it wasn't. I was still getting caught. It was too seductive. And then I started noting contact pleasant. And it was amazing, just the adding of that extra contact, which is the, the basis for everything else that follows, contact pleasant, that was enough to unhook the mind. So you could try that with the pain on the other side, contact unpleasant. You know, because that's really keying you into that law of dependent origination of how, you know, we get caught in the whole right. cycle and it's the contact feeling, those are the links that are key, you know, before or which lead to reactivity of the mind. Uh, but adding the, adding the note of contact really helped when the uh, reactivity was strong. So it's like a very specific, it's a targeted use of noting. Right. at specific times, and uh, so that could be worth experimenting with. But do you, you know, use it all the time? Do you always use you, it? Do you always use it? These days, I don't do much noting at all, you know, uh, because at a certain point when the mindfulness, you know, is, is reasonably strong, then there's a momentum and it's not even, not you don't need it so much. Right. Okay. So it's, it's really to see when it's helpful, you know, and, and when and if it's helpful. Right. Uh, and exploring different possibilities of when it might be helpful. But not to think, oh, yeah, I need to, you know, somehow this is the key to the practice. Right. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Hi, Joseph. Uh, my name is Christine. Uh, first of all, thanks so much for staying up so late for us. <laughs> so my question has to do with uh, your anecdotes and examples that you use in the book. Um, I found them many, they're very helpful, but many of them are derived from experiences when you're on retreat and life is a little bit simpler and quieter and there's less to focus on. So do you have advice on how to best take lessons that you garner while on retreat back into our messy lives and incorporate them in a, a useful way? Well, a big one, I mean, and it also refers to 
some of the things we've talked about already. I mean, one, one of the, just the, the, the foundation or practice for the busy life in the world, uh, for me, is um, mindfulness of the body. You know, because <laughs> it's always with us. Yeah. And it's just being in the habit of staying embodied and connected. Uh, so whatever we're doing, we can be in the midst of, you know, chaos. Reconnecting with the body is just always a way of uh, coming back to being grounded. In that regard, uh, one of the things I noticed on retreat, but is very applicable in the world, is just keeping an eye out for the experience of rushing. You know, so often in the course of the day, we're just, that feeling is very noticeable. You know, it's not some, if we, if we set the intention to keep an eye out for it, so every time we're rushing, every time we notice that we're rushing, that's, that's like biofeedback. <laughs> it, you know, and, oh, okay. Because what does rushing mean? It, it means that the, our minds are ahead of ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, we're toppling forward a bit. And so every time we recognize that, we just take a moment, you know, stop take a breath, settle back. And one of the great realizations was that rushing has nothing to do with speed because we can be moving very quickly and not rushing. Mm -hmm. And we can be moving slowly and rushing. Mm -hmm. you know, so, so to dissociate it from the speed at which we're doing things, it has more to do with whether we're ahead of ourselves or not. Okay. Uh, Another huge arena of practice in the world, um, which again, it, it comes out of the insights when we're sitting, but the application of it is in the world, um, is really paying attention to mindfulness of speech because we talk a lot during the day. Mm -hmm. And to really make it a practice as much as possible to check in with our motivation before we speak. Uh, it's huge, mm -hmm. you know. It's, uh, so, <laughs> I mean, besides beside seeing times when we're, you know, gossiping or speaking in a way that divides people or things as obvious as that, uh, one of the biggest areas of practice for me is paying attention to uh, the useless talk. <laughs> you know, so often we're just in a social setting with our friends and hang and I see these impulse to say something that is completely useless. <laughs> Basically, it's all about here I am. <laughs> you know, it's announcing ourselves. And I find it very interesting to see the impulse to do that. And then in those moments when I'm mindful enough, you know, not to. And the sense of relief that there's a, like a conservation of energy. Mm. You know, it's, it's a little victory over Mara. <laughs> uh, so that's another arena, you know, of, of practice in the world. And again, it, it comes from recognizing in the sitting when we can see our motivations more clearly. Uh, so, so it's applying that mindfulness of motivation to actions, you know, to our activities in the world. Uh, it's really important. You know, there's one teaching that says everything rests on the tip of motivation. So there's, you know, that's such a key element. But I think. Uh, we don't often we don't often uh, take the time, even though it can be just a moment, to really see what our motivation is mm -hmm. in various actions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that goes back to the one of the first questions about 
you know, distinguishing what's wholesome from what's unwholesome. Mm -hmm. it, it all has to do with the motivation. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Thank so you. these are just a few of the things. That, okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. I appreciate it. I want to know, no, you're pick, I see people picking up questions as you come up. They're actually the questions that we wrote down. So we have them in writing in front of us. But, but, so, but are, you, are you asking the question that you wrote? Or <laughs> that? <laughs> That's, that is exactly what I'm going to ask you. Thank you, Joseph. I'm Annabeth, and I'm just very grateful that your book has fallen into my hands and that I even get to listen to your talks. Um, and often I'm just silent afterwards. They're, they move me very much. <clears throat> so my question is, could you share, it's very different than all the other questions. Could you share something from your childhood that might have had influence on your mindfulness teaching? Yes. <laughs> uh, when I was, Quite young, you know, but like from at least as far as my memory goes back, you know, from three or four or five till I was about eleven or twelve, <clears throat> uh, I had uh, severe temper tantrums. <laughs> <laughs> you know, things would tri just something would trigger it would trigger and I would just, you know, kind of be explosive. Okay. Mostly it was directed to my mother, <laughs> you know, uh, so it made it difficult for her. Uh, but I, it was a lot of suffering, you know, but it just happened. It was kind of seemed outside of my control. But by the time I was 11 or 12, this, it was just, I didn't like that it happened, okay. you know, and I remember somewhere around that age and not knowing, of course, anything about meditation or, but somehow it came to mind, okay, before, you know, before you explode in this, count to 10. Mm -hmm. And so, and so I, I would do that and it would ease. You know, it was a way of not that immediate reactivity. Okay. And so it was really kind of the first bit of mindfulness, even though I did, of course, I didn't call it mindfulness or anything like that. Right. But it was a tool, you know, that I just sort of came to as a way of um, pausing a moment okay. Okay. before acting. And, and it really it made a huge difference. Okay. Uh, so that was one thing. The other big thing that happened kind of in my younger years, went through a period when I was about 12 or 13. Uh, my father died very young. And then I had a cousin who died in an accident and a grandfather died. So right within a year or two, you know, there were these kind of major uh, experiences of death in the family. And it was really powerful. I mean, it was, you know, it was just, again, it was unarticulated to myself at that age, but it was just that sense of somebody being there and not there. Right. You know, and the experience of that was really quite profound. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think in some way, you know, there was, it was the beginning uh, seeds of understanding non-attachment or the importance of non-attachment. Again, at the time, I wasn't, I wasn't right. thinking of it in those terms, but, but the experience of the impermanence, you know, of, was so, uh, so deep. So I think those are a few examples that come to mind. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Well. It's me, Albie, again. 
Mm -hmm. And I'm um, going to, I'm bringing you a question from a woman who is not here. She's housebound. Um, she says you don't know her, but she considers you her primary teacher. She sat a retreat with you in 1978, and she's just been practicing. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> and she just felt so passionate that I asked this question mm -hmm. of you. And I think that probably every Dharma teacher has been asked this question. But she said, um, in thinking about the first precept, that she's, she's very bothered by the condition of ants. And there are, in Southern California, as probably many other places, like a zillion, zillion ants. And many of them want to come into our homes. And she doesn't want to kill them. And she said when they got in the walls of her house, she found it impossible not to kill them. And, but it really bothers her. Um, and she wanted me to ask you how she should think about that, how you think about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a real life situation and, you mm -hmm. know, an ethical dilemma. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, I, I think I would frame it in two ways. One is um, to see when it's possible to remove them without killing. And so, for example, here it's not. <laughs> especially given the amount of snow we had this winter. <laughs> I mean, the, the ants are seasonal uh -huh. right? in, in Massachusetts. But in the spring, I, they also come into the house a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what I found is that I'm actually able with a, um, what do you call it? Just like a brush, I actually can sweep them into a dustbin. Mm -hmm and take them out. Mm -hmm. And I have to do this a lot in the course of the day. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm just sweeping them onto the dustbin, take them out. Um, so to whatever extent that's possible, mm -hmm. you know, to, 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 to apply that. Right. But there are situations where uh, more drastic action is needed. I mean, if, if carpenter ants were eating the house, mm -hmm. I probably would not say, be happy, you know, go on <laughs> feasting. Right. Uh, something, something needs to be done. And so then I think it's a question, even if we take that action, mm -hmm. you know, uh, of killing beings, um, to really do it with as much compassion as possible. What's the even though there, there will be some aversion in the mind, so that, that's going to be there. Mm -hmm. But can we surround that with as much compassion of, of recognizing what we're doing? Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a teaching which is counterintuitive, but which is, I think, very um, important, which says, that it's better to do an unwholesome action knowing it's unwholesome mm -hmm. than to do it without knowing it's unwholesome. Mm -hmm. And so people often think, oh, if we, you know, if we don't know that it's unwholesome, then it's, it's not so bad. Mm -hmm. you know, but actually, that's just compounding delusion mm -hmm. on top of whatever the action is. Mm -hmm. Whereas if we're doing something unwholesome, but we know it, so at least we're bringing some wisdom mm -hmm. to that moment. And in this situation, we can also bring compassion and, you know, understanding. But so I think that that's kind of the mitigating. Right. It's a way of mitigating the unwholesomeness. And, and uh, I'm thinking as you're talking that actually there's compassion for the animal and there's compassion for yeah. ourselves yeah, to be yeah. in that situation. Yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, it can, you know, it comes up in a lot of different, it's, you know, what do you do with malaria mosquitoes? You know, right. They, they, they're, 
there are just times when mm -hmm. uh, that kind of action is serving some, well, in that case, it would be serving some other good. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, right. but this is what, this is what makes for me, uh, the whole field so interesting, uh -huh. you know, and it can really prompt a lot of investigation and, um, you know, deepening understanding instead of just doing these actions uh, without any thought. Right. Uh, so I, I think the person who asked the question already, you know, has given it a lot of thought. Yes. And so there's a you know, the wisdom factor of mind is called investigation of the dharmas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so this is all part of it. And there are times living as lay people in the world where we're going to come up against these ethical dilemmas. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's just bringing as much wisdom and compassion as possible. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, that's really helpful. And she will be very happy to have heard that from you. Yeah. And um, I am aware that it's now 7 o'clock on our time and 10 o'clock your time. And Thanks. I just want to express tremendous gratitude to you for spending your time with us and for the tapes and the book yeah. and everything that you've done for the Dharma and for us. Right. So is there any last thing you want to say? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Stay mindful. <laughs> okay. no, it's great. I mean, I have, I have tremendous appreciation for what you're doing and, and uh, gratified that, you know, the talks in the book uh, has been helpful. Uh -huh. uh, great. So thank you. Okay. Thank you yeah. very much. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. The miracles of Skype. <laughs> the miracles, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Have a good evening. Okay, you too. Bye. 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 Bye.